uh, today. We're really pleased to uh, welcome uh, Professor Jackie Hinckley, um, who will be talking to us about the scientific basis for contextualized uh, treatment. Um, Professor Hinckley has uh, a very interesting background and CV. She is currently a professor uh, of speech language pathology at Nova Southeastern University. Before she earned her PhD, she was already working as a speech pathologist, but also as the head of aphasia services in the communicative disorders clinic at the University of Michigan. Um, then she joined the faculty at the University of South Florida until 2010, uh, after which she worked again as a clinician um, in the field and as a teacher and a trainer. And in 2014, uh, uh, she became the executive director of Voices of Hope for Aphasia in St. Petersburg, which is a, a community-based nonprofit organization serving people with aphasia. Since 2018, she is back as, uh, as faculty um, at Nova Southeastern University. Her uh, particular area of interest uh, in includes aphasia treatment research, qualitative methods and approaches, and implementation science. She is the author of two books, narrative-based practice and speech language pathology, and what is it like to have a communication impairment, uh, simulations for family, friends, and caregivers. We're very proud and pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Hinckley, and the floor is all yours. Well, thank you so much, Dirk, and thank you everyone at CSTAR for the invitation to be here. I'm so happy to have the chance to talk about this topic with all of you and, and to be here. Um, just a note though, although um, <laughs> Dirk gave what sounded like a very scattered history, but I want it to be known that during part of that time, I was sailing uh, for a few years around the Caribbean on a small sailboat so it may sound scattered, but there was a, a method in my madness. So um, if you ever uh, see me at an, another occasion, we can talk about all those sailing adventures. All right, so today I'm here to talk about the scientific basis of contextualized treatment. And um, before I begin, I just want to shout out um, to anyone in the audience who is a, a member of a multi-stakeholder research team. Um, Project Bridge is a research incubator that helps to foster uh, research teams that have researchers and clinicians and maybe people with aphasia and their families um, all collaborating together. So um, I'm not sure if anyone here is a member of one of those many teams. We have 22 teams around North America now working. So, um, But today what I'd like to talk about, uh, we will be talking about stakeholder engagement for sure a little bit, but what I'd really like to focus on today is contextualized treatment. And we're going to first think about the definitions of it, um, how to maybe better define it. And we're also going to do that by way of just a couple little uh, detours to neuroscience and cognitive psychology. Um, and I hope that in the end, we're going to, and we're going to be looking at some evidence, clinical evidence, and then um, I hope that at the end we can talk about um, better definitions for contextualization, the importance of it, and what that might mean for um, doing a better job of personalizing therapy and coming up with which therapy works best for which person. So it's been nearly 30 years since Dr. Roberta Elman, who was the founder of the very first community-based aphasia center in the United States, um, and her colleague, Ellen Bernstein Ellis, um, wrote a, a little opinion, a piece in American Journal of Speech Language Pathology on what is functional. And this piece really documents um, a switch from the previous use of the word functional, which was more in the social pragmatic, you know, the speech acts, functional acts of speech, versus all of a sudden in the 90s, we had a change in our reimbursement policies here in the United States. And functional became an imperative for goals and for the nature of treatment and for outcomes. And that imperative, um, it continues today. Uh, and we clinicians for 30 years now and continue to have that pressure of always being able to show what is functional outcome. That is the way that we get paid and how patients get um, insurance benefits for services. 
Now, um, a little while after that, it's been about 20, a little more than 20 years that we've had the vocabulary from the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning uh, and thinking about impairment, activity, and participation. And often we tend to equate activity and participation or somewhere in there with that word functional. Um, and we started to describe assessments and also treatments as either impairment focused or activity or participation focused. Now this vocabulary is very helpful from a global perspective and an interprofessional perspective, um, but there are some challenges with this. In particular, um, there are some scientific challenges for clinicians and for researchers. So these terms functional and even activity focused, um, as we would use from the WHO ICF, um, they get a little muddy, especially the way we talk about them in clinical settings. Um, we say we're going to make something functional, make it functional. Uh, and we're not quite sure sometimes, or maybe we're using the word functional to mean the outcome as well as the process. Um, as well as maybe the goal, or maybe all of those, or some combination of those, um, it gets a little, um, we're not quite sure all the time, I think, what we mean by that. Um, and when it comes from, a, to a research or scientific point of view, um, using those terms can be, I think, really confusing. Um, and also tends to imply or has it has been suggested that there is a lack of precision and maybe a lack of oper operationalization, especially when we start talking about functional therapy or a functional process. And so this is, um, I think, one of the challenges that I hope we can talk about today and maybe move forward a little bit on. So I'd like to start with um, looking back to uh, a randomized controlled trial in traumatic brain injury, which was done in the context of the VA. And in this particular trial, um, the comparison was between functional experiential treatment and cognitive didactic treatment. So these were the terms used in this trial. And as you can see, functional experiential treatment was defined as experiential tasks in real life settings, um, which uh, dependent on mostly on errorless learning and targeted the development of functional abilities. Um, here are some of examples of the activities that fell under functional experiential. So this is newspaper reading, card games, meal planning, et cetera, giving speeches. The cognitive didactic, didactic um, treatment group um, received didactic tasks in clinic settings and it tended to be a trial and error type learning. Um, and because this was a study of treatment in traumatic brain injury, the target was primarily on various executive functions. Now, this trial, um, which had, as you can see, an N of 360, um, used a primary outcome measure of returning to work um, at one year post onset. So this, I think, is a, I want to start a little string of thought among us here of using an outcome that really is a big, a big outcome, <laughs> one that really matters to the patient. Um, and interestingly, they did not find any particular difference between these two treatment approaches. Um, but what they did find was that younger patients in the cognitive arm had a higher rate of return to work, but patients older than 30 years and those with more education had higher rates in the functional arm. So they started to see, although there were not significant differences in the ultimate outcome uh, between these two approaches, starting to see that there were different um, that there were different, uh, that there were var variations or different uh, patients of different uh, characteristics might be responding differently to these two, two approaches. Now, building on that work and much more recently, Bogner et al. Um, 
used developed really the terms of contextualized and decontextualized um, again in the context of traumatic brain injury and inpatient rehabilitation um, and um, defined contextualized treatment as treatment that was provided in in the midst of the real life activity and that decontextualized treatment were clinic-based activities that were targeting a particular um, impairment. Um, one thing that's important to note about this uh, study, this large study, is that these categories of contextualized versus decontextualized were also validated by a panel of TBI patients and family members who discussed and agreed on whether um, activities or treatment tasks seem to be uh, in really contextualized or seem to be leading to um, obvious use in real life settings. So um, to get a little more specific in the definitions that they used in that study, um, the contextualized treatment was defined as holistic. Um, they were training a whole task. It was in naturalistic set settings and very realistic, whereas de decontextualized was uh, had the intent of training a particular cognitive linguistic function. I think we often say impairment based when we're thinking of this now, uh, because we're thinking that it. we assume that that particular function underlies an everyday task. Um, and the improvement of the component function should improve the everyday activity. The training was in a clinical setting and didactic in nature. Now, this was a longitudinal observational study, not a randomized clinical trial, um, but there were uh, nearly 2,000 uh, participants, patients involved in the study. Um, and uh, what they found was again, this was in the context of inpatient rehabilitation, that if contextualized treatment is incorporated into a patient's um, re overall rehab, that it significantly improves community participation at nine months post-discharge. Um, and they wrote, while the findings do not imply that decontextualized treatment should not be used, when the therapy goal can be addressed with either approach, the findings suggest that better outcomes may result if the contextualized approach is used. Um, so again, similar to the previous study that I was highlighting, not necessarily, um, uh, well, there is a difference in the sense that contextualized treatment needed to be included for, I believe it was between 10 and 20% of the total rehab to produce the effect. Um, so it's not a, an exact comparison of the two, but it is uh, an establishment or observation that we need that contextualized treatment to actually achieve um, these important goals uh, and outcomes. So there are, I wanted to highlight a couple of examples of contextualized treatments in aphasia therapy, since those two previous examples are TBI examples. And while there are many other examples, I just pick script training as an example um, and conversation therapy because there's a pretty decent evidence base and we understand what these treatments are. Um, script training tends to rely on less errorful learning. Um, it's focused on whole functional language and it definitely builds in salience and personal relevance and motivation. Uh, and it produces improvements in spoken language, including sentence forms, narrative, and conversation. The reference there is a review. Um, and similarly, conversation therapy has uh, is full functional language, focus on salience, personal relevance, and motivation. Uh, and the idea there is to focus on strategies that allow the person with aphasia to be a successful conversation um, partner and to progress from being more passive to a more active conversation partner. Um, now, these are, I think, pre a couple of pretty clear examples of contextualized treatment in aphasia therapy. They tend to happen in real life. In fact, script training includes a whole section in which the, you go out with the client and use the script in the setting in which it's meant to be used. Um, excuse me. Here we go. 
Um, so um, I just want to point out, though, that contextualization um, seems to be appropriate and important, um, even for assessment of non-language cognitive abilities in aphasia. Um, when compared to other standard paper and pencil type uh, cognitive assessments, the Kettle test um, was the only test that was not related to um, severity of language abilities in a study by Wall and colleagues. And the Kettle test is a very real life contextualized naturalistic test in which um, the person is putting together um, some tea. Um, so you can access that Kettle test on the Rehab Measures uh, website. Uh, but I think it's an important point that that's another thing that we've observed about contextualization. Now, even though I mentioned two examples of contextualized treatment in aphasia therapy, it turned out in the Bogner et al. TBI study that a lot of times in speech pathology, the treatment wasn't clearly contextualized or decontextualized. And that really turns out to be because speech pathologists are working on things. You know, we're working on how to talk to your bank teller or order in a restaurant, but we often can't actually go to the restaurant. So we're not actually in those realistic settings very, uh, very well. So um, they went back and found that many of the um, treatments that were conducted by speech pathologists in that uh, rehab setting were better characterized as quasi-contextualized. And they defined this as a treatment that references real life functional or meaningful activities, but does not incorporate the actual real life activity or environment. And there is an explicit explanation and promotion by the therapist of the relationship and relevance between the task and the everyday function. And the patient, therefore, has to be able to connect those dots between the treatment practice and the real life activity. Um, now, again, the very importantly here, the quasi contextualized treatments um, were validated by this panel of uh, patients and family members. And so if they could identify that the treatment had the intent of uh, leading to use in a real life activity, it became characterized as quasi um, contextualized. So um, the outcome here was that if quasi contextualized speech treatment is provided for at least 5% of treatment during inpatient re rehabilitation, there is an improvement of community participation over the first year post discharge. So we're starting to see in this uh, fairly large data set, which was TBI and inpatient rehab, that contextualization or even quasi-contextualization um, makes a difference in uh, an important long-term outcome. And they wrote, while contextualized treatment is associated with better outcomes, the use of quasi-contextualized treatment should be considered when logistics preclude the use of contextualized treatment rather than defaulting to the use of decontextualized treatment. So from their project, they really established a bit of a hierarchy there here in terms of um, preference for contextualized treatment, if not then quasi-contextualized, and if neither of those, then um, I guess you're left with decontextualized. Now, it's not to say that decontextualized treatment doesn't have an effect because it does. Um, and um, we'll, I'm gonna show some data about that in just a couple of minutes. But first let's think about a couple of quasi-contextualized aphasia treatments. At least I'm going to consider them quasi-contextualized aphasia treatments. I would be happy to discuss this. Um, Constraint-induced aphasia treatment is a treatment um, which has verbal constraints and is produced, is done in a group setting and there's language games played. Um, and so there's interaction. So to me, this is, fits the idea of quasi-contextualized aphasia treatment because while there is social interaction, um, the real intent is that you would take that verbal fluency that you develop and take it into other settings as well. Um, and then multimodality aphasia treatment is similar in terms of group setting and language games and the way that it's often implemented. 
um, but it, it allows the use of any effective communication modality. And the recently published results of the COMPARE study um, concluded that both of those treatments were better than usual care for word retrieval uh, and functional communication and quality of life. But they found that the multimodality aphasia treatment seemed to be better for quality of life and the constraint induced seemed to be better for word retrieval. So again, when we have these direct comparisons, we're starting to see that while both may produce um, good results for a major outcome, um, there might be some differences that we can start to, to sort out and start to think about um, treatment selection choices in a much more informed way. So Rose and colleagues wrote, these are important di differential findings rejecting the one size fits all approach to aphasia therapy prescription in this highly heterogeneous population. The results are a major step forward towards more targeted allocation of aphasia treatment and personalized rehabilitation. Now, I want to take a little uh, tours or stop in and think about um, neuroscience very briefly. Uh, I'm not intending to get into this in great detail, but I do want to just link our thoughts about contextualization um, to two principles of neuroplasticity. And in particular, we have some principles of neuroplasticity, uh, which um, seem to make a lot of sense in terms of contextualization. First of all, specificity. So um, we know that we often see limited generalization or transfer of skills associated with certain treatments. And this is uh, lending support to the idea that the brain wants to train exactly what it's going to do. Um, and then salience, um, emotions and motivation modulate memory consolidation. So anything that is going to be personally relevant, personally motivating is going to have an effect. And then the final one, which was more recently added um, in the paper by Karan and Thompson, um, complexity. And the idea of complexity, which seems to be coming across uh, in many different studies. So we know that in semantics and phonology, for example, uh, when there are complex, more complex structures trained, they seem to transfer to simpler forms. Um, and so there's some kind of downstream effect. And um, using Giovanetti, um, as well as um, some work that I've done with my colleagues, um, we they proposed, and I um, also see it, that I think we can take that idea of complexity and maybe move it into contextualization. I think that contextualization is possibly, and this is something we need more data on and we need to discuss, but I do feel that it's possibly a form of complexity that also has downstream effects. And we see it a little bit in some data that I've collected. And also um, Boyle um, showed this in a paper reviewing a number of different discourse and conversation therapies that had, it seemed to have downstream effects on word finding. So without training word finding, we train conversation, we get effects, uh, improvements on word finding, for example. So there's not a lot of data on that yet um, at a, at levels that are different from semantics and phonology and syntax. Um, but I, I think it's really something to consider. And um, I definitely wanted to bring it up here as we're thinking about contextualization. Now, in a recent um, review of aphasia treatments that have been studied with neuroimaging, a systematic review, I just took those treatments that were listed in that systematic review, uh, and here they are, and then I thought to myself, are these decontextualized or quasi-contextualized or contextualized or what? And so the Ds and the DQs that you see is totally my own opinion, and we might discuss this. Um, I also think that an important thing to note in speech pathology and in aphasia therapy in particular is that many of the therapies that we have could be done 
in either a more or less contextualized way. And I think actually that's a, a potentially fascinating line of, of uh, investigation as well. Um, not all, um, but there are some treatments that could probably be more or less contextualized. So let's on this list, let's just take pantomime cueing. Um, for example, I think that um, you know use of gesture could certainly be done in a fairly decontextualized way if we're just working on gestures associated with certain words or meanings. Um, but we could probably contextualize that quite a lot by walking down to the end of the hall and working in the kitchen or having coffee and incorporating gesture into a much more contextualized approach as well. Um, and I think this is, you know, following on the work of Bogner, I think this is uh, really something interesting to, to think about. Um, so um, we have a lot of work with decontextualized and, and again, maybe quasi contextualized, depending on how it's implemented. Um, but we haven't done a lot linked to neuroscience really um, uh, in terms of truly contextualized therapies. So I want to take another little detour to the world of cognitive psychology and um, just touch on the some basic uh, theories of skill acquisition. Um, so there are a couple different perspectives that have been around for a long time and they're still around um, and still being written about and being used. And that's the confidential perspective. Um, and that idea is that any task can be decomposed into particular skills. So conversation can be decomposed to word retrieval and syntax, et cetera. Um, and um, that training is to improve that specific skill. Uh, and the idea is to practice the pieces and then combine that to get the whole target that we're going for. Whereas a more episodic perspective is that there is a whole task with contextual cues and we need to train that whole task in a very context specific action. Um, now to get into a little bit more details about these, the episodic approach, um, which um, is often, or I would say most often talked about in terms of instance theory. And the idea is that any event that you attend, you, you go to a restaurant, you go to a restaurant and you are storing the whole event of ordering for yourself at the restaurant uh, over and over as, as an event. And then ultimately that can be linked to different kinds of cues, but we have these retrievable memories of the whole task performance. Uh, and um, this theoretical approach suggests that learning and automaticity are strongly context specific and not necessarily widely generalizable. And that's in contrast to confidential theories um, where the idea is that you can um, practice um, in independent skills and that would be used across different kinds of tasks. And especially once they're automated, these confidential skills would generalize widely. Um, I think it's important to note that in a slightly related field, which is second language acquisition and how people learn other languages, um, the episodic um, cognitive approach is the dominant one now and has been for a little while. Um, and it's just, I, I, I'm not sure what I'm saying about that, but I think it's interesting to think about. Um, so both of these theoretical approaches have slightly different predictions, which um, luckily can be, are testable. Uh, so in an episodic approach, um, the contextualized treatment should result in improvement in that particular context that was trained, but and it might be generalizable, but mainly generalizable to things that are similar to that. And I'm going to be showing you um, examples from some of uh, some data um, about that shortly. Um, the outcome of the treatment might be more likely to rely on controlled processing. In other words, use of very explicit and conscious strategies to achieve 
the outcome or achieve complete the task. And there may be less improvement on general abilities um, overall compared to competential theories, um, which would predict that if they're with their association to the more de decontextualized treatment, um, would present would predict that one particular component would improve and that that component which underlies multiple tasks. So we should see wide generalization. Um, and um, since the training results in improvement in general abilities, there may be less observable progress on a targeted task. So we work on word retrieval and the word retrieval really improves, but we don't see as much improvement as we might like in conversation. Um, so we have differing approaches. And I would say that these cognitive theories uh, are really aligned with um, the ideas between contextualized and decontextualized uh, treatments. And therefore, they present us with the opportunity for testable predictions. Um, so I want to share a little bit about um, some uh, data that I've been collecting for a long time. <laughs> Um, uh, so what I'm going to share with you today is uh, the story of some data from 32 uh, people with aphasia who were randomly assigned to two groups. One group was con more contextualized treatment and one group decontextualized. Um, there were no differences between the groups uh, in terms of aphasia type or severity, age, time post onset, or any of the pretest scores. So the Testing battery had uh, was focused on different modalities as well as language modalities as well as functional um, assessment uh, by the measured by the cattle, which is the communicative abilities and daily living test. Um, we also gathered discourse measures, and we also had a cognitive battery which we um, uh, administered only at the beginning, um, so at a pretest time, and this included two measures of uh, I guess what we might broadly call executive function, Raven co Raven's colored progressive matrices and the Wisconsin card sort test. So um, how we set this out was that we wanted to take a functional goal, <laughs> a, a functional goal, which is also linked by the way to a functional outcome in the world, in a clinical world. And so, um, the goal that we selected was being able to order something from a catalog, and this also became our criterion task. Um, we There's a long story behind how we developed this catalog ordering task, and there's a manuscript under review right now, um, and I'm happy to talk about this later if anyone has questions, but I just want to say that it was um, designed with a lot of detail, um, and it was designed from actual um, scripts on if you call somebody, I know no one does that anymore too much, but you can still call. I don't know about you guys. I'm getting piles of catalogs all the time. You still can call or if you go through a um, uh, an ordering uh, ordering online or anywhere, there's a set script and order of, of what information you have to put in and uh, the typical order. So we went through a, a design of making sure we had all that very in a very realistic way. We used um, real catalogs. Uh, we made credit cards that um, each credit card number sampled every possible numeral. So the numerals zero to nine were represented in every credit card number, et cetera. So, um, and then we, we borrowed, um, many thanks, Audrey Holland, we borrowed um, with her blessing, the sort of cattle scoring of zero, one, and two, zero meaning no response or a completely unuseful response. One is, you know, close, um, maybe had something in it that was correct, and two was a fully communicative response. Um, so we assigned uh, people with aphasia into these two groups. And so the contextualized and the decontextualized treatment both had as their goal to be able to order something from a catalog. 
Um, so the contextualized treatment was really a role play. Um, so it was, we tried to make it with real catalogs and everything else as realistic as possible. Um, and of course, there had to be individualization in terms of what strategies worked for the client to actually be able to do it. Um, but each treatment session in the contextualized treatment was one pass through, through this role play that we set up. Um, the decontextualized treatment um, consisted mostly, although not exclusively, uh, but I'll focus right now on oral naming abilities. Um, so what words do people need to say if they're going to order something from a catalog? So we chose um, categories of words that were relevant to that, and uh, we went through a baseline process and each client worked on trade items that were selected from the consistently missed during the baseline sessions. Um, and we each client also had, of course, an individualized queuing hierarchy, which might include semantic, phon phonologic, or what have you, different types of cues. Um, so in this study, we uh, did not have a set amount of treatment time. We actually allowed the treatment to progress until each person achieved the criterion, uh, which was basically 90% accuracy on whatever they are working on in the two, in the two um, treatment types. Um, so you can see here that for both treatment types, um, there was actually not a lot of, on average, there was not, the average was not a lot of treatment to achieve this criterion. Um, and which makes sense. We're really just shooting for being able to do one functional activity, right? Um, uh, but um, there was a wide range of uh, time required. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, we had a number of different measures that we were able to look at, but primarily what I want to focus on is the actual ability to order something from uh, a catalog, the catalog ordering task. Um, we designed both an oral and a written version um, so that we could sample different modalities. Uh, and we actually had two different conditions for this task, which I won't talk about too much today. Or I, I really not planning to show um, too much data from that today. But um, we, the participants all did this in quiet, and then they also did it in a concurrent task condition, um, in, which was intended to evaluate um, the how durable each of the two trainings might be, or how susceptible to distraction each of the two trainings might be. Um, I wanted to share how we um, evaluated our treatment integrity because I think it really is important for operationalizing and thinking about these different types of treatments. Um, it's not just a matter of steps, but I do think it's possible to operationalize um, this kind of approach, contextualization. Um, and so this is our radar sheet that you're seeing. We used direct observation of randomly selected recorded sessions by independent raters, and our treatment integrity was 85%. So some just some selected results. So one thing you see here is that there was a group effect that is, so the treatment mattered if you want to be able to order things from a catalog. So if that's really important to you, then the contextualized treatment made a big difference rather than just working on the names, the, the word retrieval of words that you would need to do that task. Um, there was no difference in between the two groups on oral naming. However, um, I guess I have it on the next slide. Everybody, everybody did improve. It's just that there wasn't an effect of the treatment. Um, so to put it in a, to visualize this pretty simply, um, uh, the both groups improved on the catalog ordering and on naming. Um, and 
uh, if we compare their pre post performances, um, pre to post, it's a, both a statistically and a clinically significant improvement. Um, but you, I think I, I wanted to put it so simply in this chart here to really emphasize the difference that if you're really going for being able to do a particular real life activity, what the difference of contextualized treatment really makes. Um, and it's not to say that decontextualized didn't help. It did help. Um, and both treatments helped a lot of things. Um, it's just that, you know, what are we trying to use it for? Um, and I think that's really the story of getting into this idea of contextualization. Um, just briefly, I, I do want to say that the contextualized training um, also enabled people to be um, pretty resistant to disruption in our, um, in our uh, dual task condition. Uh, and um, another interesting thing uh, that we saw was that both in both treatments, um, writing really improved, even writing in a, the functional task of a catalog ordering, being able to um, type and write um, an order. Um, and that improved in both groups, both treatments. Um, just a quick look at um, the relationship of cognitive abilities um, to some outcomes here. So there was a negative relationship um, between Wisconsin Card Sword and Ravens um, for the uh, treatment time required to achieve criterion in the contextualized treatment group. Um, so in other words, um, the lower your score on those cognitive abilities, the more time it took you to achieve criterion in the contextualized um, treatment. And no such relationships were observed in the decontextualized um, treatment. And then I think one thing I failed to mention is that we did have a follow-up session, um, which was six to 12 weeks after the treatment was completed. And so uh, we also saw that cognitive abilities were positively correlated to um, performances that follow up in the contextualized group. So in other words, the higher your score on Wisconsin Card Sword and Ravens, um, the more likely that you had still had a high score um, at the follow up time on, um, um, but this was not true for the decontextualized treatment. So a um, little interim summary about these data. Um, the participants in both groups improved on something um, or a little bit on everything. It's just the way they improved and which things they improved the most on. Uh, and there was a very interesting observation that everyone improved to some degree on naming. Uh, and regardless of whether it was the contextualized or the decontextualized treatment. So there was something about the contextualized treatment that also had that, what we were, I was saying earlier, calling a downstream effect to naming as well. Um, the, um, of course, contextualized treatment lens is going to lead you to be able to do the thing that you're practicing. Um, and I think that's an important, you know, uh, it, there we can debate this a little bit and have a discussion, but I do think it's important to maintain our eyes on the ball of what's really important clinically, especially if we want to do, um, if we want to contribute knowledge and produce research that is going to actually be usable um, by clinicians in real life who are, um, you know, facing the functional outcome or we don't pay you um, scenario several times every day. <laughs> um, uh, and there was no significant, so there were no significant difference between the groups for scores on oral naming. 
uh, there was uh, a little bit of greater variability um, for the participants who received a contextualized treatment. And I'm still sorting that out a bit. I think I'd like to be able to, um, I'd like to be able to see if I can find any pattern in that variability um, because it might help us think more clearly about what are the characteristics of somebody who's going to be benefit more from a decontextualized approach um, versus a contextualized pro approach, et cetera. Um, and then um, what I'm hoping that we can discuss and some takeaways, um, first of all, contextualization really matters. And it matters on so many levels. Um, it, it matters if we think neuro, about neuroscience and plasticity. Um, it, there's cognitive theoretical predictions related to it. Um, and then we have evidence that shows us that it matters. And, and then beyond that, we have the practical, right? When the clinical. Um, pressures that we are operating under, and that is not trivial. Um, so contextualization really matters. Um, from the evidence that I reviewed today with you, um, I think uh, we can observe that contextualized treatment is more likely to lead to a clearly functional outcome. And I think this is what we really need to be shooting for. Um, especially in uh, this day and age when we know that people are, you know, in many places, people are getting 10 sessions, 10 therapy sessions for their aphasia. Um, here in the state of Florida, it's 10 30-minute sessions. <laughs> it's not even a whole hour. So we've got very little time to make an effect. So if the burden is on us to really figure out um, what are the characteristics of somebody that is going to lend themselves more so to either a contextualized or a decontextualized approach. Um, also, um, in some earlier data, you know, we observed that the contextualized treatment might have a better effect in short-term intensive treatment. Um, and I think it's because if you have a very small amount of time, if you can get that um, if you can have somebody actually be able to do a real thing that they really want to do, um, and maybe there's downstream effects to it, and then there's going to be a little bit of transfer. Um, we tested some near transfer um, with pizza ordering and restaurant ordering, so not just catalog ordering. Um, but, you know, you by targeting one thing, even in a short amount of therapy time, I think we can have a bigger effect than we think. Um, and it, this deserves more research attention, in my opinion. Um, we're also starting to see the story emerge that we maybe, as we gather more data, we'll be able to parse out what are the characteristics that are better for each of these. Um, and um, so, um, some maybe some additional discussion questions for us. Um, I am really, you know, the more I've thought about this over the years, I really think that contextualization has gone by different names at different times, but I, I'm really liking contextualization these days. Um, contextualization can really be an overarching principle. Um, it could be executed to different degrees, right? So we can decontextualize, we could quasi-contextualize, and we can contextualize something. Um, and that ability to, um, to contextualize to different degrees is maybe something that is going to allow us um, to operationalize things with even more precision um, and translate it to um, more clinical uh, more in more clinically usable ways. And then I really want to, as a final discussion point, say that um, anecdotal comments in some, occasionally in some publications, have suggested that people with aphasia um, sometimes express a preference for either 
contextualized or decontextualized treatment. And I, I hope that we, you know, will be incorporating the voice of people with aphasia more so into um, what treatment is right for them. Um, you know, if we continue to find that um, there's both, either way is going to get us to a good place, right? The person's going to improve whichever treatment we pick, but there might be a slightly um, different, this one's going to lead you to this kind of an outcome faster versus this one. You know, we can really start to define that and be clear about that. We need some more evidence, but if we could be really clear about that, um, we could actually go down the road of what many other healthcare disciplines are doing and um, ask patients for input on which kind of treatment they would prefer. Um, right now, it really is the clinician who is selecting the treatment. Um, and while there are certainly clinicians who get input on goals and other things, I think, you know, let's be realistic that mostly we are not asking for input on what the nature or the type of the treatment is. Um, so I, but I think that's a place we can go and it might turn out to be very fruitful for the same reason that I said earlier that, you know, in neuroplasticity, salience matter. So, um, it might be a very fruitful direction. Um, and, uh, so these are some question, questions I hope to discuss with you either today or as we move along in the future. Um, I want to thank you very much, and I have many, many colleagues and mentors to thank, but um, today I want to especially acknowledge these three who um, have with, been with me for a long time, uh, and so if you have any questions or contact me, I'm happy to answer questions now, but please contact me, or if you'd like a full list of references or anything like that, please email me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, that was a wonderful talk, and we have questions in the uh, in the in the chat box. Um, uh, I want to start with questions here in the room. But first of all, I can't believe I didn't ask you. Uh, I didn't get to ask you about the sailing. I definitely <laughs> want to discuss that with you. At some point. Maybe not now on online during your talk, but uh, yes, I'll have questions about that. Um, so let's see. Any questions from us in the room? It's nice to meet you virtually, but I'm a PhD student here in the aphasia lab and my passion is completely on functional communication. I think there's a lot of research to be done and that has already been done, but a main thing I think about is yes, contextualized treatment, but I think it might stem from having to get a concrete interactive assessment first to inform therapists to make these goals, because I think therapists make goals, they only have a limited time for therapy. So if we were to make an interactive, adaptive, accessible functional communication measure, don't you think that would inform more contextualized and decontextualized uh, person-related therapy within any healthcare setting? Or what are your ideas on that? Um, well, it sounds great. Um, I. Uh... As long as, yeah, I, as long as, I, I think the idea of it sounds great. <laughs> it's the, the quantifiable measure of objectively saying how they're scoring, but I just, I guess my overarching idea would be that we can find their strengths and weaknesses within communicating in any mm -hmm. modality. And then if we can give a measure to those clinicians of saying, hey, this is what they do really well, and they can go out into the community and participate almost immediately after having a stroke because they'll have one form of communication, but then also working on those weaknesses and then kind of creating their own profile individualized to them. Yeah, I'm, 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 well, I'm intrigued. I, I'm having, I guess, lots of previous kinds of functional assessments that have existed in this world are running through my brain. And so I'm just I'm trying to envision how it's a bit different and maybe this is not the, I don't know if this is the time or place to go on about that, but um, I mean, generally speaking, I think that sounds, that sounds great. 
I have a, a lot of other comments for you, but I'm sure you, I'm going to keep know, it. Do you know the work of Alyssa Lonzi has nothing, it's not to do with aphasia, but in her work, um, she has developed a tool that is really designed for people with um, cognitive impairment and dementia. And it's a very functional assessment that basically assesses what memory strategies they're already using and what their so what what is their affinity for what strategy they might use? And um, if I'm understanding you correctly, it sounds like what you would like to do is some something like that for aphasia and communication. So you might be interested in chatting with her. I absolutely will. That sounds great. Um, that's right up my scope, but I would, I don't want to take up too much time. I'll definitely be reaching okay, out to thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, let's, but, I'd love to chat offline. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Thank you. So any more questions from our room? Doesn't seem to be. Okay, let's go to the questions online. Um, first question is from Kirana Tsapkini. Uh, let me go to it right now. Could decontextualized and contextualized treatment be construed as two steps of treatment? First, decontextualized for the language cognitive impairment, and then contextualized for transfer of treatment in everyday life. Um, don't you think that even the, the term decontextualized is somewhat imprecise or even biased since it implies that training the language or cognitive deficit has nothing to do with its contextual or functional use in everyday life? Uh -huh. Um, well, for the first question, um, yes, I, I certainly think that, um, you know, many of our treatments um, have been designed to do the part that I call decontextualize first and then to build on it as, as transfer. And I guess uh, the reason for um, contrasting those two treatments is maybe to explore whether that's really necessary um, and what do we what do we really get out of it and do can we just go ahead and go straight to contextualized treatment rather than doing the decontextualized first um, and as for the second part of the question um, I suppose you're quite right that the term decontextualized does have a bias for it uh, to it and um, we'll have to think about whether there's a better way of talking about it but in this case today, I am using those terms because they've been used by others um, and uh, linking on to their definitions. But it's a good, excellent point that that does tend to have a bit of bias to it. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you would comment on how you think um, uh, individual differences between people with aphasia, and I, I think you hinted at it in one of your last slides as well, like preferences, but uh, differences perhaps in age, education, and also general cognitive abilities may influence their preferences as well as response to contextualized slash episodic versus decontextualized or compositional approaches to therapy that might account for some of that wide variants that you found in the decontextualized mm -hmm. group, right? Yeah, absolutely. So in the early TBI studies um, that I described, they did find that there were differences based on age and education. Um, and others have observed differences based on different variables. I, differ I definitely saw it more associated with cognitive abilities, but I do think that there is variability in response so that those those factors definitely definitely um, mediate response to either contextualized or decontextualized treatment. Um, for example, in my data, it even moderated you know how much treatment time was going to take to achieve the criterion. So it definitely and then and then there's preference too. So I think there's also a level of there's also something about individual or personal preference that's not captured by any of these other variables like age and education yeah. and cognitive abilities. Um, there's something else too that's just preference. And I think all of those are certainly um, mediating factors and things that I think we're gonna learn better how each of those relates to, um, to the outcomes of, of either approach. Yeah. 
I, I think that's probably very similar to what, what happens in second language acquisition, right? Which right. not to draw the comparison directly, obviously, but um, there too, all else being equal, you might say, well, yes, immersion is the way to go. But some people really learn very well that's by right. learning, by root learning, for example. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this is where we need to have this conversation is that, you know, um, some people are just going to do better in one way or another, and and we need to learn better how to accommodate those individual, identify and accommodate those individual differences. A related point uh, was also made by uh, Kirana. Would you agree that given, and I, I think the answer is probably going to be no, but would you agree that given the Wisconsin and Ravens negative correlations, it seems that contextualized treatment is best for the most impaired participants, but decontextualized for all. Uh, I I would not I would not agree that. Um, well, I guess what I would say is, with the data I shared today and looking at that little slice of data, I suppose. You know, what you might say actually is that those who had those who had the lower cognitive abilities had to work a lot harder. It's it's really um, um, on the other hand, how long, you know, what, uh, I'm sorry, I need to back up. What I'd love to do is take those participants. This was not the design of the study, but I'd love to take this and do a crossover, right? So I'd love to take those participants who um, got the contextualized and then later get the decontextualized and vice versa, right? That would be beautiful because I would love to see how each individual participant responds differently. And I don't have that because I have a randomized trial. Um, but I think, I think it's a very important question. Thanks. Um, Finally, uh, uh, so far at least, um, I'd love to hear whether or how optimistic you are about the use of uh, virtual reality technology to apply some kind of pseudo contextualized treatment, right, in the clinic. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I think the idea, the idea behind virtual reality is fabulous and very exciting because it does uh, allow us to add in an element of contextualization that we can't do in any other way. So I think that's very exciting. Thank you very much, Jackie. We're at the end of all the questions. Um, love to, we get a lot of compliments online from Will Evans and uh, from iPhone to everyone. Can't see who that is. Uh, Emily Garnett and Kirana also say, thank you and go blue. <laughs> All so right. thanks for your talk and um, thank you audience for your participation and see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>